There's that view. That's what I've been waiting for. Reason I planted everything where I did. Oh, it's so pretty. Gingers with that dark foliage from the cannas behind them, and then the big Alexander palm with the bananas and the sun blasting through. Elephant ears in the background. Detail and color. Love it. Sit back, do my morning things at the counter on the computer and whatnot, and just bask in the glory trying to take it all in while i can because you know in a, what, several weeks this this is all going to be going it's just going to be brown there's not going to be anything to see there and then i'm going to throw the curtains up because you know why would you just want to look at nothing not much fun hey what's up garden friends jeff here how's everybody doing hope you're doing well i'm great kind of tired had a long weekend and so is turbo turbo's pretty tired too you sleepy baby yeah he's out cold he had a six hour play date yesterday with his cousin. Just played and played and played. As far as gardening tasks are concerned, I'm mostly just gonna be working on pulling some stuff up that needs repotting and maybe do some planting. I don't know, we will see. What I've been tackling right now is an issue that I've had to deal with with this Robolini palm it's multiple times. I'm sure y'all have heard of scale, right? A little generally hard little insects that show up on the foliage of the plants. You can scrape them off, do all sorts of things with them to get rid of them. The date palms sometimes get red scale and it's a whole different ball game trying to get rid of those things. General consensus is to use a high concentration imidacle proid with like the Dominion 2L, which is what I did a few years ago with this. And it worked kind of for a few years and then it slowly has come back. The problem with those high concentration systemics is that sometimes they'll also just like kill the plant. Not if it's done right, but the last time I did it, I had a professional apply it because it was a grade that was so high that like you can't even purchase it. And uh, then, you know, had to repot the plant next year and totally flush out the roots. Otherwise that it has a residue, a residual, a lot of systemics at least good ones have a residual in them so that they'll stick into the soil and continue to release for a very long time. But if you, you can't plant flowering things then in those containers once you use those. So it was a whole big thing. This was several years ago and it only like kind of helped and it almost killed the plant. So I've taken a different approach and uh, I have gone and I'm trying to get into the center of the crown. There really isn't much to see there, but that red date scale gets in really close and it looks almost like mealybugs but it's more fine and if you can get in really close with like a lens or a magnifying glass you can see the tiny little red dots of that specific type of scale they're generally tight and close in there they look fuzzy they're kind of waxy so the first thing to do is with anything that has that waxy coat is hit them with the alcohol did that and then i used the mist function to try and get that to rinse off let it dry off then I have been hitting it with soap and horticultural oil. And I've been doing that like it, to the extreme, like to the extreme where it, like it, it could, it might kill the plant. But here's the thing. If this can't be eradicated in the next two weeks, the plant's gonna die anyways, because this goes into winter storage at a greenhouse. And I'm not gonna send a plant back to that greenhouse that's infested with something that's going to get onto all the other Robolini palms. That being said, it probably got it from the other Robolini palms that are stored at that facility, but I don't wanna hit it with another systemic. You have to wait at least 30 days to know if they're even working. The plants can be picked up in two weeks, so that's not really an option. And then you come back to that other issue where it's like, I can't put anything that flowers in the pot again without unpotting the plant, flushing the roots totally clean and still you need to be careful afterwards and that's not all systemic sometimes are necessary they need to be used properly with a lot of caution and my backyard everything drains into a storm sewer so i am really cautious about what chemicals get used here because it just, that seems inconsiderate right to just be like okay chemicals just go wash into the storm sewer and let that now become everybody's problem. Something to be taken seriously. It's not likely to be eradicated from spraying. Red date scale is a, it's a pretty difficult one to get rid of. Oh, and it has regular scale too. I talked in the Robolini video about this particular pygmy date palm. It has always been a pain in my butt. I've grown plenty of others that really were not an issue. Like they just grew. They were great plants. This one specifically 
has always been uh, like, a, I don't want to say a problem child, but I just have always wondered if like there's something wrong with it. Potentially maybe a virus, something like that, that's, and there's something that maybe weakens it because it has great soil. It gets its fertilizing. You know, I take good care of the plant. It's in good health, so it shouldn't be as prone to pests and disease, but here we are. So there's the update of what's going on right now. Today's Monday. We'll see if this thing's still alive come Friday. Hopefully it will be. I don't know. We will see. There has been a drastic improvement over how this looked before. I you know, was trying lots of different things. Nothing was really working. When I was just using like rubbing alcohol and neem, not much was happening there. So now I'm using the rubbing alcohol, the neem, soap, and peppermint oil just like hitting it really every single day. Enough that, like I said, it could kill the plant. Again, if I can't get rid of it, the plant's dead anyways, because I'm not going to send it back to storage and it's not going to go out in my house with the rest of my collection, because it also has regular scale, which I'm not as concerned about. That's not as difficult to get rid of. So uh, hopefully we'll see some improvements here, but if I'm being totally honest, it just doesn't seem like it would be the proper responsible thing to do to send this to a facility that's full of other palm trees, a lot of Robolini palms too with this going on, even though that's likely, not even likely, that has to be where it got it because this plant, it hasn't been in Florida in like a decade, probably. So that's really, that's the only thing that makes any sense. Trying to be uh, extreme and gentle with the plant at the same time. Hopefully won't just have to let it go in the winter time. Hopefully good things will happen. But again, like I said, if not, it's gonna be okay. And then just a little bit more context about red date scale specifically. Typically the red date scale is only found on the rattan palms, the pandanus, which are the screw pines, on the Canary Island date palms, reclinatas, which are the Senegal date palms, the robolinis, which is right here, Washingtonia filifera. There's been some reports on eucalyptus. So it's not something that you probably have to worry about if you've had your plant in the house for a really long time. I believe their life cycle goes four generations per year with some overlapping with the end stars. The females lay eggs. They also give live birth to some of the young. The males live basically only to fertilize the females. I believe the gestational period is a minimum of 60 days, which is a fairly long time for a pest. I'll have to double check on that one. And I'll link some articles below if you just want to read up on it. If you're just curious, want to know some more about this particular critter. Anything that has a gestational period that long where they go from egg to larvae, those are more tricky to treat. You have to stay on top of it. And you have to be careful too, because overusing chemicals, well, that can be a problem too, which is why I've mostly just been sticking with the oils and the soaps for now. Any like real chemicals that are made for bugs, I would be very cautious about spraying over and over and over again, because one, overspray, potentially bad for the environment, and because of disease resistance and buildup. It's another reason why I'm handling this very cautiously and before I'm just jumping into the systemics. The way I've been going about this is pretty typical of how most people start off trying to handle scale. You want, you know, try and blast them off if you're feeling gutsy and not worried about it spreading to your other plants. In this particular scenario, that's not really something I have to worry about because nothing out here should host this specific scale, but it does also have some hard scale on it too. Then you start in with the soaps and the oils to be safe. And if all else fails, you either say, okay, time for this plant to go or try a systemic. I just really don't want to go the systemic route again. If it were springtime and uh, I had the time to go ahead and apply that systemic every 30 days like it needs to be done because the 60 day life cycle, systemic's not going to do anything for eggs. Those have to hatch out and start feeding before it's going to do anything. So a minimum of 60 to 90 days really to be treating with that and then time for the plant to recover. Maybe I'd go that way again. I don't know. Honestly, I don't think I would though. I really try and avoid the systemics as much as I can. It's not easy. I don't like talking about these things, but it's just part of gardening, right? When you have a gardening channel, nobody wants to be like, hey, this plant's sick and I think I may just have to let it die. It just seems so irresponsible to send it back to that greenhouse with an infestation on it like this. Even though, like I said, I'm pretty sure that that's where it came from. Doesn't mean that I need to be that person too. That's not going to be helpful. These things just, happens sometimes and there's not much you can do about it and I don't take it lightly because the plants are living things and I don't want to just let them die that's why I'm doing everything I can with more mild approaches and just really 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 staying on top of it but sometimes it's just for the greater good of the other plants you, you just gotta 
cut your losses. Like, you know, a few years ago, I had a huge magnolia over here. It was over around the corner where the Alexander Palm is now. And uh, a huge, like, wave of magnolia scale went through St. Louis and took out a lot of the deciduous magnolias, including mine. I was presented with an option from the horticulturists, from the, like, landscape companies that come out here. And it was basically you pump the ground full of chemicals. They come in and, like, actually inject it down into the ground. Really harsh stuff, a systemic, to kill that scale. Uh, or you, you cut the tree down. And there were a lot of people who were upset with my decision, which was to cut the tree down. Because, you know, they're like, oh, it's such a beautiful tree, and it's so sad to cut down a tree, which I fully agree with. It's always sad to have to cut down a tree, to have to sacrifice any plant. But I wasn't going to pump the ground full of chemicals because, well, that's just, that doesn't seem like a great thing to do for the environment. And all of the garden bed here is full of drains that all go to that storm sewer. So that would have been going right into the water. I, I can't do that. And then I can't just pretend that it's not a problem and let it keep killing the plant because plants that are infested like that, they start to get diseased and diseases spread to other plants. And that could have easily taken out the maples and the oaks and all sorts of other things. So the right thing to do in that situation was to just cut it down, get rid of it, leave that area bare for several years, at least not put any deciduous magnolias there and I think the tulip trees that they can get that magnolia scale too. I think they say three years was how long to wait or no that was for um, a type of bacteria that lives in the soil. With the magnolia scale I think that was just like wait a year to a year and a half before if you wanted to replant that same plant. That's what I was trying to say. It just it stinks having to make these decisions especially when it's on camera and you know everybody gets to see those fails but that's part of gardening. When some you lose some in this situation, probably going to lose some, even if I can get this plant to a point where I don't see anything on it, I still don't think it'd be smart to send it back to that greenhouse. And I'm gonna consult with the people who take the palm trees and see what they have to say, but I'm pretty sure what they're gonna say is, uh, no, we don't want it. You can go ahead and keep that. The particular scale, when you're dealing with like the soft, fluffy, tiny grain scales, on the Robolini palms and other palms that have that white powder, there's a white powder that naturally occurs on those palms and on queen palms and a lot of palms. It can be harder to notice it in the earlier stages because it just blends in with everything and it's not until they start to get into a larger cottony, more three-dimensional mass and you go, uh-oh, there's a problem here. So I didn't even really notice anything until around probably mid to late August and the problem is just continued. Stayed on top of the springs the more natural way and it wasn't until about a week to a week and a half ago that I was like, okay, all the oils, all the things I have, we're just hitting it, going hard, seeing what it's going to do. Probably a big waste of time, but maybe a learning experience. That's what I'm hopeful for. Maybe you can see, you know, what specifically I have to do. I'm not throwing everything at it haphazardously. I'm paying attention to what I'm using and what the effects seem to be from each one that I'm using and how much I'm using. So that, you know, if this happens again, because I'll probably get another Robolini palm. Though I don't know if there's much of a point when uh, the storage facility is full of other Robolini palms that they bring up from Florida. And that's, like I said, probably where the issue even came from. I don't know. That's something that's going to require some thinking. But we'll just have to wait it out and see what happens. Although, but I'm pretty sure what's going to happen is I'm just going to have to let the plant go. I'm going to have to let the winter take it because of all the things I said before. I just want everybody to know that I'm not taking this lightly. It is something that I take seriously. It's always a shame to lose a plant, but sometimes you got to cut your losses. He just woke up and then he came over to the door like a good dog, started barking. So I let him out and then he ran over to, well, I won't show you, but he just, it's like, well, I'll just pee on the patio. Who needs grass when you just pee on the patio, which would be bothersome. However, I take that as, look who's finally figured out the difference between hard four outside and hard four inside. That is progress. That's good. Still would prefer that he pees in the grass. Anyways, option number three. I didn't really list off the other things as options one and two, but you just go with it. I'll say what I feel is likely to happen here. What will go on? Chances are, since the greenhouse isn't going to want this and I don't really feel right about sending it to them. The Robolini palms generally are good to about 25 degrees for a short period of time. They can sometimes go cooler than that if you have them in the right situation. This isn't a microclimate talk though. What I'm getting at is I will probably leave it out, let some cold blast away at it, 
more than likely defoliate it, push it into the growth space, put it under some intense lights, start a fungicide treatment because you have to take care of any rot that goes on in there. Potentially do a systemic. I should do a systemic if I actually want to eradicate the problem. Like I said, if I do that, then uh, really have to be careful about everything that goes around the plant for a very long time. At the very least, let the cold do its thing because these little scale bugs not usually an issue outside the tropics. So that would lead one to assume that the cold probably takes care of the bugs and the eggs. Yeah, right? Maybe? I don't know. I suppose we will find out. I can't put it in the house because the pot that it's in, it doesn't fit through the door. So this is, this is really the only option. Instead of just letting it die, well, I'm gonna let it almost die. <laughs> See what happens there. Not ideal, but probably the right direction to go. You know, when you have a plant that's infested with an insect, then you already know that their immunity and their overall health isn't top peak because it's battling having little critters sucking the juices out of it. So if this were further along and the problem were even more large than it is right now, I don't know that I would bother with all of that because the sickly plant isn't as likely to rebound, but figure it's worth a shot. May as well see what happens. I think I would rather nurse it back to health from some cold damage than from systemics. So that's what's going on there. Colby, you being camera shy, you've been chowing down on that head of lettuce for a long time and now you're just done. There you go. Get that breakfast lettuce, Colby. I think there's some rain moving in here, so I might be putting a pause on, apparently, apparently this is paused in my mind, on what I was about to work on, at least until I know whether or not the weather clears. Oh, hello, Rose. Flushing out with some fall color. Is that overexposed? I can't tell. That's actually really exciting because I had, I'll get back to what I was gonna talk about in just a second. It's exciting because I had mentioned that I wasn't positive I was gonna be able to keep those roses over here because well, there just isn't much point if they're not going to be getting the sun during late summer and into fall because they can keep flowering, you know, probably throughout the month of October, depending on how warm it is. But the sun over here has shifted so, so, so much that it was getting pretty shaded here. Roses, you know, if they don't get enough light, they can they can be difficult to take care of. All kinds of mold issues and mildews and whatnot. I'm not seeing much coming out of these, but I would imagine if I were to pull these, which I'm not going to do, but if I were to pull these right now, these alocasias, that that would open things up some more to get some light in there. Because that spot where that little stick with the flowers is, that's one of the darker spots in this corner. So that's, I don't know, I'm just, it's a good sign, but I should probably still move them next year. I don't think this spot's really gonna work out for them. Hey BB, where are you going? All right, bye Turbo. By the way, Turbo, stone pathway right there. Turbo's preferred path and Toby's preferred path is right here, up through all the impatience and the plants, and then they just like to dive right through there, and sometimes they'll walk around over here, but that's why, uh, yeah, the impatience didn't take too well right here because they decided to make this their little run through. Just fine, maybe I'll find some new stones at some point or lift these up to make the path more visible. That might work. I mean, they're dogs. They're always going to want to run through the dirt, aren't they? It's so whatever. I'm not getting upset about some radio looking impatience, especially this time of year. On the note of the impatience, these need to go, or at least a big chunk of them need to go. It's time to go ahead and do some fall planting. Ugh, they're still so pretty though. Oh, I don't know what to do. I might be having some people over next weekend. So like, well, could, should I, maybe I should just wait one more week. Should I do that? I don't know what we're gonna do with the rest of the vlog because my plan was to go ahead and get things planted over here, but uh, but everything still is just, it's looking so lovely. At least in the spot where I want to plant the things. Over here, I, mean, I could pull these up no problem because you know, they're done. They're done for the year, but ooh, those leaves are looking sticky. That means that there's something sticky dripping on them. Did you finally get infested? I knew it was gonna happen, these crepe myrtles. Let's have a look here, yep. All right, white fly and aphid. Okay, so I, now I know what we're gonna be doing in this vlog. I gotta cut the crepe myrtle down. Best to let them defoliate on their own and move into fall on their own. I'd rather just, it's just gotta go. I was giving it a shot and now it's proven me right. It's gonna be a problem. And there's some lightning, so. I'll handle that later. It's time to go inside, Turbo. Let's go inside. Always something. Hey, at least we're getting rain. I'm happy for it. Look at how great the Rolia's doing. I, 
I never staked it up. But I mean, let's be honest, who saw that coming? I don't care, staked up or not, so pretty. Isn't it beautiful? This is by far my favorite shade of purple, that like lighter, sort of creamy, lavender, periwinkle purple. I don't think that's a thing. I've told y'all, I don't see colors normally. You can tell me what kind of purple that is. I just look at it and say, hey, that's pretty and I like it. That's good enough for me. All right, radar's clear. Got my snippies, yard waste barrel. Time to take care of this thing. It amazes me how a plant can go from being, or seemingly being totally fine to just covered in bugs and what, a week and a half, two weeks? The garden tour I filmed was, I filmed that about a week and a half ago. And I think I talked in that video, it could have been a different video, but I had remarked about how I was going to get rid of the crepe myrtle because I'm just tired of all the pests and all the problems that come along with this particular plant. I have no attachment to it anymore. It's just become a royal pain in my butt. But what I was saying was how surprised I was that for like the first time ever, it wasn't just covered in aphids and white flies, but I had remarked like to just wait and see. Because it seems like usually every year around late August and September is when they usually show up. So they were just a month behind schedule, that's all. I know. There are plenty of sprays and things that could be done about this. But this is not a plant that I am attached to. It's just become a thorn in my side. So I would rather just like be done with it. I'm gonna cut it down to wherever the bare wood is. There are some crepe myrtle varieties that seem to be more sturdy than others, but this one, the Natchez, nope. It's not a problem for everybody. I know plenty of people who grow these and this is never a big deal for them. I know it probably seems drastic, but like I said, this isn't a plant that I have any attachment to at this point. Like, I just want it out of here. So I cut basically everything off, got it over here into this yard waste bin and uh, lightly sprayed it. But I should have mentioned, I lightly sprayed, like I had a pile of all this stuff down here and I very lightly sprayed it with a diluted soap just to stick to the aphids and white flies and help hold them down so they wouldn't just run amok everywhere. This is a very sturdy crepe myrtle. It'll come back next year and uh, when it re-sprouts and starts to put out some new growth, I'm going to dig it up and give it away to somebody else if somebody else wants to have to deal with those issues. Sometimes when you get a crepe myrtle into full blaring sun and uh, they have good airflow around them, it's not always as big of an issue. It's just this one specifically, the last like four years in a row, it's been a nightmare and I think you've probably caught the gist of it at this point. I'm kind of over all the spraying and everything. I really don't want to do it with plants where I feel it's necessary. So I'm glad that I saw the sheen on the leaves. I did have to trample through a few impatience to get in there, but that's okay. That's always the thing to look out for is when you start to see like weird discoloration and spots on top of the leaves and there's a sheen on them, that's the honeydew. That is basically the excrement from the aphids and white flies. Milliebugs will excrete that too. The ants will even farm the mealybugs and the aphids. Like they'll make sure to guard them, and protect them, and keep them organized so that they can eat that honeydew and the saps and things that they're able to get out of the plants. Then as that ages, it turns into the sooty black mold, which I don't have much of yet, but when you get really deep in here, you can see where that was starting to develop over here on the impatience. And there's a little bit of extra sheen on the impatience because I also made sure to hit them with that soap so that all the critters that were raining down on top of there would get suffocated. Pulled the dumpster over here so you can get a better look at what was going on in those leaves. See all those tiny little dots? Those are the uh, white flies. There's still some scattering about. And you, white flies outdoors, they've never been a huge problem for me except for on the crepe myrtle. Indoors, they get annoying. They're not the hardest thing to control. You usually use sticky traps and then again, just use like the soaps and the neem. Stay on top of it like once a week. Usually the problem is resolved within a month or so. If I see an infestation like this, I don't think it's smart to just be like, oh, well, there's gonna be frost in a couple weeks, so no big deal. Uh-uh. I have plants out here that are right right next to it that are going to be going inside. Now the alocasias, I trim all the foliage off of those and just let them sit dormant during the winter time inside, so still not as worried with those, but there are other plants in the area. Seeing as how they can fly, makes sense to me to knock out a giant infestation while I can and while it's easy. No, oh, there's white fly and aphids on there. Didn't see any mealybugs. But that's not really very surprising. And of course, tons of ants. Ants and crepe myrtles, they love each other and the ants are largely one of the reasons that the infestations get so out of control on 
those shrubs. And really that crepe myrtle didn't even make sense to have plants it over here anymore. Once upon a time, these arborvitaes, arborvitae, however you want to say it, these were much smaller and it got a lot of sun and it towered above everything and it was glorious and beautiful, but that's not the case anymore because the shrubs have grown so large that it gets kind of shadowed out, doesn't get full sun. So it's, this isn't the happiest spot for it regardless. Now there are some thoughts with gardening with the garden where sometimes it's not a terrible idea to keep a plant around that's going to attract all of the pests because it's like a moth to a flame or a bug light, whatever that saying is. The thought there is that then the insects, those pests are gonna be more concentrated in that one spot, which I can see the perspective behind. I get it, I have a tree fern where I just kind of let the mealybugs hop on there and then I know to go over to it every couple weeks and spray it down and get them off and it does somewhat deter them from hopping onto the other plants I've noticed or it doesn't deter them it's just they prefer the one over the other and when you have something that's targeted so instead of them being spread all around in smaller amounts then it's more concentrated in one spot yeah in some circumstances it does make sense to just go ahead and let that be but with this I'm gonna say nope I don't think so it's gotta go it's gotta get out of here I had a few of these branches that I left unglued so we could actually see the bugs on there. You can see how the leaves are discolored even from the other side. You can tell that they're not solid green. They're very mottled because all the juices, all the good stuff's been sucked right out of them. You see that? That's not healthy foliage. Okay, so it took care of that. Now I just need to very gently, whoa! <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. Might be time for a new tripod. What the crap? As I was saying, I'm going to go ahead and tuck these down in here. I should spray them somewhere, but I ran out of my soapy solution and then get this out of here and get it to the driveway. I'm actually you know, glad to have that done. Been debating digging that plant up for a long time and now I'd say that that was the nail in the coffin. I'm ready for it to go. Okay, now I need to dig up the Pharaoh's mask. Uh, I'm gonna, you know what? I think I should actually probably go take a shower and change my clothes because I'm absolutely covered in just like insect excrement. I feel absolutely disgusting. And I'm sure I got some bugs on me that the soap didn't stick to. So I'm gonna do that. I don't know why I had to tell everybody that. I probably could have gone done that, come back and nobody would have known any different. Okay, all cleaned up, ready to get back to work. The uh, um, only other thing I meant to mention with that crepe myrtle, there are a few things I probably could have talked about that I didn't, but I had mentioned that I was going to transplant it in the spring. You can transplant shrubs in the fall if you really want to. Spring is usually a better time. Late winter, early spring, it just depends on the shrub. With the crepe myrtles, they're not fully hardy here. I'm in zone six. Really zone seven is where they tend to thrive. Seven and further south are just warmer than zone seven. So because of that, just for winter survivability, I prefer to wait until going on here then quadruple checking absolutely everything in sight now that I've had those scales and the white flies I'm like oh no there's just bugs on everything but it was nothing just some dust for survivability reasons I, it just makes more sense to wait until spring when the plant starts to push out just like a little bit of new growth so I know that it survived the winter to begin with and then lift it up and move it and I, I'm just going to give it away somebody else can have it somebody who has more sunlight so the pharaoh's mask Fun plants, they're pretty wonky looking. It's supposed to look like this. That's the appeal, the shtick to them is that they're supposed to look like they have a virus. I think the foliage on them just looks fantastic. Then this Alexander palm, which is, it's up there. This is potted inside of that plant's pot. The place that I store the palm trees at that comes and takes them during the winter time, they don't care or guarantee anything that's planted underneath the palm tree like they just guarantee the palm tree and even then they don't really guarantee it but if something happens they'll replace it usually just like for good business so because of that I need to lift this out and pot it up and I think that it would really probably benefit from being in a different container anyways so we'll talk about that in a minute so I had thought about going in here and cutting it back and then lifting it out but I, don't know, I think I'm probably just going to take a stab at seeing if I can't just come in here and lift it out yeah not too surprised by that. I'm gonna go ahead and get this moved into a really moist potting mix. Yeah, things are starting to get a little bit crowded over here. No, so not a lot of roots, but that's not surprising. That Alexander palm, or really any palm tree, they fill out their containers with so many roots and we tend to leave palm trees in the same containers for such a long time that they're not 
always the best for underplanting because there just isn't a ton of space in those containers for roots from the annuals or what else has been planted in those containers to spread out. So that's why I was, didn't really think that there would be much going on with the roots of this plant because they didn't really have a lot of space to spread. But this does have some runners, which is cool. That's exciting. There are two of them. One right here, another over here that looks like it got snapped, but it should be all right. Those red grouse, those runners, those will pop up more plants, more foliage. And I'm potting this up in the Espoma potting mix and I want to grab, I need some compost. So this plant in particular, the Colocasia pharaoh's mask, likes things moist. A lot of people who have great success with these are growing them marginally, like on the edges of their ponds or in planters in their ponds. I did that for a while with some of my others and repotted them in a separate video. And I just didn't get much growth out of them, but the pond didn't have many fish in it. So the water wasn't really all that nutrient dense. Here, baby, come on, no coconuts. I keep having to take coconuts away from the puppy. And they had been potted up in a coconut base blend, which, you know, I love coconut, but you do have to stay on top of amending it. It's really the same thing with peat, but I've just noticed the coconut does seem to become more barren, more void of nutrients faster than does peat. But I will still continue to use as much coconut as I can because it's much better for the environment. It's really neither here nor there. This is just me leading up to explaining why I'm blending in compost into this mix because they like things organically rich and the compost is going to help this blend hold on to more water. Surprisingly, I think this could use a few more handfuls. I'm going to make a well in here so I can get the plant down into that. I'm planting this in a nice shallow container because they like such a moisture retentive soil. Plants that like a lot, a lot of moisture in their soil when they come inside, those can be problematic plants, especially when it's not just that they like a lot of moisture, but they like that really organically rich, more of a dense soil. It still needs to be airy, but hopefully you know what I mean there. There we go. So the plant still has plenty of room to spread its roots around because it's a nice wide container for it, but it's not so deep that there'll be a ton of anaerobic action and just decaying gunk going on down lower in the pot while things are taking an extra long time to dry. That's where root rot starts to happen. So that's the only reason I'm using that more shallow of a container. If this were full all the way to the top of soil and it needed to stay like I'd say 80 to 90% wet at all times, then there's just a lot more space down low where those roots haven't even gotten down there to utilize any of the water where bad things can happen. Make sure to get this very well watered. Another reason I like to have these planted more shallow is because look at how much space that gives me to give this plant a heavy drink. Oh, you can't even really see what I'm talking about. I'm gonna get this thing off the tripod. This is what I meant. I'm able to really flood the pot and give that more time to saturate and go on down there. Otherwise, you know, it's just a constant back and forth when I have this inside with a watering can. I don't like doing all that. I prefer to just be able to give the plant a heavy drink and let that soak in. I know it doesn't look like it's draining very well, but that's just because the soil needs to soak up all that water. It will drain more quickly at some point, but right now all that soil does need to soak up some moisture. Probably should have pre-moistened it, but that's all right. Begin with the same heavy drink to start with no matter what, and this is good. That soil is going to stay moist for a good amount of time in between waterings, which is what these very weird elephant ears prefer. It would be a good idea to go ahead and prune off some of this foliage. I will do that. My snippers are inside sitting in a cup of rubbing alcohol. Be sure to dry those out and bring them out here. I wanted to make sure to disinfect my clippers. So I cut down that crepe myrtle, which even though it didn't look like it had any diseases, it was covered in bugs and it was covered in bugs and it's more likely to be susceptible to disease. So I just figured I should make sure they're extra clean. Last year with my uh, Pharaoh's masks, I kept them uh, consistently moist and uh, under some grow lights and they kept growing, but not very much. In the winter time, I think you could go different directions with these. You could probably keep it in active growth or let it go dormant. I don't know. The ones I have, I don't think are anywhere near large enough or established enough to let them go fully dormant. So I just kind of keep them on the cusp is what I do with them or what I've done with them. This will only be their second winter in the house. So don't have a ton of experience to speak with from that, but I'm just trying to build off of what I learned last year, which was that it was really hard to keep these plants watered last winter. Soil dried out way too quickly for them. And when I was able to remember to water them every single day, they did much better. So that tells me that they obviously need a more moisture retentive soil. And I had them up on wicking cord last year. So they were basically being self-watered and still had to dunk water on them almost every day to keep them happy. I don't think that's going to be a problem with this one. 
Doesn't seem very likely. I have it over here where I've been doing all my other transplants because this spot, the light comes through nice and dappled because of the bird of paradise right here. That way I don't have to worry about it being scorched by the sun. Basically just want to keep them away from extremes when you've torn up their roots and repotted them. It's going to take it some time to reestablish itself. And then there's one more plant that I really want to make sure I take inside. Not going to be needing the compost for that one. All right, there it is. It's kind of big. This is a canary winged begonia that was in the windmill palm planters out in my front yard on my front porch. Potted those up back in, I don't know, maybe May-ish, somewhere in there, May, June. And in the last garden tour, I talked about how I really liked them. And uh, with the luck I had with the dragon's wings last year, I figured I should maybe give one of these a try during the winter time because these are a type of dragon wing begonia. So why not? They just have larger foliage that's more of a chartreuse -y. A lighter green with a really beautiful flower heads on them, which I'll be sure to show you. I, so I had the same issue with this plant as with the uh, Ferris mask, which is just those small root balls. So what happens when you have annuals plants around other plants that have a larger root system. So normally I would have pruned this back before pulling it. But I wanted everybody to be able to see it, just like how absolutely huge this plant got. And it could have probably gotten much bigger than this. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to keep all that on there with that small root ball. I mean, I guess I probably could, but it just doesn't seem like a good idea to really try. So I'm going to go through and prune most of this off of the plant. I did make sure to sanitize these. I think I already mentioned that, that I had them soaking in the house for a little while. There we go. That seems more proportionate, right? That's less that this small root system is going to have to support <laughs> while it's trying to reestablish itself. You can only ask so much of the plants. You take off a whole bunch of the roots, it doesn't really seem realistic to hope that the entire plant's going to survive. I could cut these pieces right here into segments and get them rooted. This particular begonia, though, I believe is a one of the trademarked patented ones, so I won't be doing that because of, you know, the legal issues that go behind that, even though, I mean, technically that's about selling the plants, but there's a gray area. I don't mess with gray areas just to be safe, especially when it's all on camera and documented. That would seem silly, wouldn't it? See those flower heads? By the way, the sun is right on my viewfinder, so I'm just hoping that everything is in focus. If not, then I, I, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I picked this pot specifically for this begonia only because of really the proportions. That was it. Didn't have anything to do with the look. I was just like, okay, this is a nice heavy pot. When I water it in the winter time, if it's getting hit with the hose, that shouldn't be getting blown over and knocked down. And it's semi-glazed. Like it's glazed on the top, but not on the bottom. Could be an issue as far as the moisture content goes for the plant. But since it's the bottom that's unglazed and the top that is, I think that it should be okay. If it were the other way around, then there might be some concern that there would be a lot of moisture being held down here because the pot's not breathing as much as it is up top. But uh, I think this is okay. I just gotta tap the brakes and remind myself not to overthink things. This should be good. Especially considering the uh, begonia, the dragon wing that I kept in the growth space last year. It was in a glazed ceramic container. There's nothing special about it. It was just in a potting mix that drained really well. And it's really all there was to it. That one last year just grew. It was so simple and so easy. It wasn't in the slightest bit demanding. I did keep the plant more on the dry side. Cause it just helped it get through because I didn't keep the growth space all that warm last year. So I didn't want it to be too moist because we have issues with root rot since I didn't have the heat up very high. I'm just burping that soil, get all the bubbles out, give the plant a good drink, add more mix if need be. And that's pretty much it. I see that? Lots of bubbly action. That's why we call it burping the soil. With these dragon wing type begonias, really all begonias, drainage really is key to success. So that's something I have to watch out for with this. I even considered, I thought about maybe putting some packing peanuts in the bottom of the container. That would help prevent the hole in the bottom from getting clogged up, but I don't think that's going to be necessary. You know, that's a debatable thing. People go back and forth about raising the saturation line. Usually if I put things in the bottom of a pot, it's to help weight it down more so than for drainage. I like to use the mesh screen for drainage. I just don't have any right now. Or I'll do it if I have a really, really deep container that I want shallow rooted plants on the top of like succulents, then I'll go ahead and fill that up as much as I can with something else then try to find a container that will fit into the top of that and just have that under there to help hold the plant up. None of that really matters. The whole point here was to get a lot of that foliage cut off so that the tiny root ball can support <laughs> what's actually on here 
on the plant and, and be sure that the potting mix is one that drains well and isn't going to stay moist for too terribly long and that the plant is supported and sturdy, which I would say it is. Even though it's been all chopped up, I gotta say, I still think it's a nice looking plant. It'll look better when it flushes out with more growth, but this is, I'm not so disappointed by this. I think it looks nice. Lots of room for potential here. <laughs> then if this plant grows the way this, the regular pink dragon wing did for me last year, then it should be in flower most of the winter, assuming that it has time to get to that point. So I need to reestablish itself, get some more growth on it, because you saw the bloom out of the tip, so it's gonna have to put out some new ends. I guess we'll all find out together this winter and see what happens. Hopefully there's still enough warmth left in the season here for me for this to establish itself. I think that there should be Not to fully establish itself, because I mean, I'm sure we'll have frost sometime in the next two to three weeks, probably. But up until that point, That'll give it some time to recover and then I'll get it inside under those grow lights. Keep it toasty until I start to see signs of new growth on the plant. I didn't use any type of starter fertilizers, anything like that. I didn't do it with the Pharaoh's mask either. I already had all the compost that was going into that mix. I didn't want to add too much into it. Compost is fantastic. I love mixing it into a potting mix. It doesn't need to be done cautiously. If you know that it's in there, then that is helpful because you know what to watch out for because a lot of decaying matter that increases everything going on with the ammonia and the nitrogen down below there and just huge spikes of bacteria good and bad bacteria so when it's time to move the plants inside that's normally when i back away from using a lot of organic matter in my potting mixes is there's less airflow it's less warm it's just, things just go wrong so much more quickly inside than they do outside in the springtime when i bring them out that's when i like to amend and get all those composts and things in there the ferrous mask just needed it for richness and drainage i think that was important for that plant the begonia definitely not it doesn't need it and the potting mix i'm using has some of that mycorrhiza in it but there's a lot going on with that potting mix lots of good stuff in it to help facilitate new root development and to get the plant going so i think that the starter fertilizers would have been unnecessary because the potting mix that i'm using uh, especially with the ferrous mass since it has the compost in it as well and those starter fertilizers really just any of those organic fertilizers it's just more organic compounds that can break down and lead to root rot if things aren't nice and toasty and that's what i want to avoid happening <laughs> keep things squeaky clean or as clean as possible with plants all of our plants especially ones that we've been cutting and chopping on and pulling the roots out of. Keeping things as sterile as possible is best. This potting mix is by no means sterile at all, but just not introducing too much gunk in there to lead to more problems. Mm -hmm. This is a fun plant. I can't wait to see what it does. I love the foliage, the color, the flower heads on them are so big and vibrant. Just, I love dragon wing begonias and the angel wings, but the dragon wings, they tend to be more floriferous. They have much heavier seasons of color on them like with that pink dragon wing i mean that one bloomed for me all winter but look at that it's just a shower of flowers they have some versatility to them which is fantastic this one gets a really good amount of sun you can see it in its leaf form and how the leaves are more cupped and the entire plant's more stout but then you can also have them in a more shady area like this one right here which is really leggy actually it's probably pushing close to 30 inches high here but it's still doing well it's still flowering it's still a lovely plant. That begonia that I'm referring to is in there. I think I need to get in there and free that plant. That's really, really getting suffocated by that coleus, isn't it? Okay, that actually still looks pretty good. I did give it a repot in the springtime. I'm not really gonna be able to see because everything's grown so much, but this is the one that was in the growth space last year. I gave it a big cut back, repot it into a larger container, and I'll take it inside with the canary wing. <laughs> you can't even see that thing in there. Oh, and there's the other pharaoh's mask done a good amount of growing since it got repotted it had to sit around for a while and reestablish its roots i'd say in the past week or so it's really just started throwing out new leaves left and right so took it a while but it's getting somewhere i would get in here and go ahead and pull that begonia out but i have a project i need to work on over here i don't know if you can you see it i can't see anything with the angle of the sun right now I can't see anything through my screen the hot tub's back so first time in a couple years that i'm going to be able to use that i'm going to need to do some rearranging not a lot just enough so that you can actually you know get to the hot tub need to get it cleaned out and all that fun stuff i'll probably get working on that next week but for now this is going to have to do got some repotting done got to fill everybody in on what's going on with that red date scale it has been a couple of days i forgot to like say when there's been a transition rain was moving through at one of the points in one of the clips and i was like okay gonna go inside so this video has been spread out over a few days i haven't seen any negative effects yet from the spray on the robolini but we'll just have to wait and see we'll keep everybody posted on what goes on there Ooh, that is a beautiful leaf all right it's time to go hope everybody's doing well having a great day and a great life and everything's just 
going beautifully for you. Carpenter Bee over here having a nap on the freckles. Comment down below, say hi. I love talking to everybody. Things going well in your gardens right now, your fall gardens, or is it like that all over where you live? You already moved into fall and just not even messing with things anymore. I hopefully still have a couple weeks of niceness out here, but who knows? The palm trees are going next week. I'll try and vlog that. Maybe but that may not be until the vlog the week after. It's not gonna be coming until late in the week. It's kind of complicated, but there, there's still gonna be lots of fun tropical plants out here for, like I said, hopefully another couple of weeks, but you just never know. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.